we're at that point, right? When we have to articulate, we have to progressively move away from those very, very basic ways of explaining value. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I have the great pleasure of speaking with Geronimo van Schendel, who is an architect and educator. Um, he is the co-founder and CEO of um, Buildia, which is a software platform for the construction industry, which delves deep into solving many of the estimating and procurement supply chain issues that the industry currently faces. Um, Geronimo is a Spanish Colombian architect. He studied at Harvard University at the grad school there. Um, he's studied with and in alignment with the MIT Sloan School of Management. Management. He studied in Madrid, in Lisbon, um, and has a rather impressive academic um, CV. As well as that, he has also served as an office manager and has worked as an architect uh, in renowned architect offices. He's worked internationally in Spain, China, um, in Latin America. His independent work is focused on identifying scalable entrepreneurship opportunities in the intersection of design, AEC and technology, um, mainly through platform business models. He's worked with architects such as Cruz y Ortiz, uh, Rafael Moneo, um, and AS, and he was also a collab fellow of IDEO. And he's also the academic director at the moment uh, at the IE for the Master in Business for Architecture and Design, the MB Arch, which is basically an MBA in the business of architecture, which is I couldn't think of a more important topic. So clearly, Geronimo and I had an enormous amount to talk about. I'm amazed that Geronimo and I haven't spoken earlier in our careers, but it was well worth the wait. This was a really deeply fascinating conversation. I'm sure Geronimo, Geronimo and I will talk again um, and we could probably sit and chat for many, many hours. But in today's episode, um, we really talk about the value chain in architecture and how to raise fees through understanding the complexities of the value chain and the commercial underpinnings of any architectural project. And we really do point uh, and probe into the kind of problems uh, of how design is currently taught and how we see an overemphasis on design and how that's problematic, um, particularly when we have students and professionals coming out after a long period, a long gestation period to become an architect. And we see this in, in low fees right across the globe. So we discussed the three principles for an architecture practice to raise fees and understand their position in the value change and how to communicate value. Um, we look at strategies for uh, meeting a client upstream and kind of getting a seat at that, at that table at an earlier part of the conversation, not when they know that they need an architect and they've decided how much they're going to spend on an architect and a finance person and a lawyer has already made those decisions and then we're left to squeeze our fees into a small hole that's been predefined. We talk about how to actually meet a client upstream and begin de delivering value. And um, Geronimo gives some examples of, of practices that he's seen do that rather successfully. So this is a deeply fascinating topic. I think Geronimo is one of the leading experts on, on this topic and has a deep understanding of both business and architecture. So sit back, relax and enjoy Geronimo Van Schendel. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Geronimo, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Very good. Thank you so much, Ryan, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to share a little bit of my life and story. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, you're based in Madrid. You're originally of Colombian origin. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. 
Amazing. And you're the co-founder and CEO at Buildia. Did I say that right? Yeah, that was right. Brilliant. And you're also the academic director at the IE of the Master in Business for Architecture and Design, which is a pretty extraordinary and unique course um, where students are basically learning or getting an MBA, but with an architectural and design context, which I think is an just a, an enormously valuable piece of education that anybody could uh, to to get into. So you've um you've also worked at IDEO as one of my favorite companies. I think they're absolutely absolutely brilliant. Um you've been a teaching assistant uh, and you were educated as well at, at Harvard and you've also of course you've worked as an architect and you've got all the all the professional chops as well so a very impressive and fascinating career um i guess the first question would be a little bit about how did you find yourself in the position uh, it, with the ie uh, as the academic director and, and what is this masters in um, in business for architecture uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, um, well, I feel a bit, a bit humbled by that introduction. Uh, very kind. In, in fact, it's been a, a very interesting journey. And I think in a way, all the different components are quite connected. Um, going straight to where I, how I ended in IE, and uh, which is very related with the mission that drives this uh, MBR, Master in Business for Architecture and Design program. I think that also um, responds in part to uh, what was the role of each and every one of the previous steps in a way. So I was trained as an architect and engineer. Basically in Spain, we, we get the, the license and we can also uh, you know, work as, as engineers for MEP structures and all that. So I got um, the, the licensure here and the Polytechnic University of Madrid and then I um, started my my career. I started practicing what I was studying in 2008. So it's been already a while, uh, 15 years. Time goes by pretty quickly. Um, and I had different types of experiences when I when I started working, and then I graduated in 2010. I had this uh, very strong um, willingness to be a designer and. Uh, uh, I, I still have a lot of passion for the, let's say, design side of our industry. I'm, I'm very, very passionate. I enjoy a lot of that. But I was also very, um, I wouldn't say frustrated, but I was very um, motivated by the, by the, some sort of blockages that I was seeing in our industry to sort of deliver its message, deliver its value, um, mm. uh, develop or un unwrap its whole potential, and. One of the ways I saw to explore, you know, potential doors to open or paths to explore and try to to um, to, to work on that environment was trying to see um, how different types of companies worked. So not just going into, you know, a design office and, and doing a career there or pursuing only from the very beginning my own design office, but like trying to go from very small companies to bigger companies, from design of private world to public world from, you know, infrastructure to housing or retail um, and even having my own, uh, if you want, uh, joint turnkey project company that used to do design, uh, the construction, significant part of the construction management and down to uh, interior and, and even decoration and turnkey for retail and, uh, and housing. Um, these first seven years of experience were very intense moving from one point to the next uh, mm. a little bit like uh, what you would say you know, a little bit of a frog profile quite uh, <laughs> wanting to see everything and do everything at the same time uh, but i guess it it, it was a, a very um uh, it was a process of learning very very fast um and there i you know at, at one point i had the opportunity to really expand my studies and uh, at that time it was 2014 i was uh, still having my the company that I had well, where I was doing design and, and construction for small private uh, projects. And it was the middle of the, still the middle of the crisis in Spain. And I was, since the very beginning, I finished architecture, I was really motivated to go and expand my, my studies mm -hmm. and learn about new things. So I found at Harvard University, I found this opportunity of um, uh, going into the MBR uh, 
um, sorry, into the MARC2. <laughs> um, and it's a program that is very interesting because it helped me or it allowed me to explore my, my, my um, design interest, but also kind of craft my own, uh, my own path to my own academic curriculum and combine mm -hmm. that with MIT Sloan, uh, um, the Kennedy School for, for leadership, for business entrepreneurship and so on. So, and, and I did my own, um, my own journey, which was a very, very different journey from other students that uh, I was sharing the program with, which were the vast majority were very focused on, uh, let's say, design in deep. Um, and I somehow considered that that's something that you learn along the way. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the talent and interest for, so I wanted to explore more. So there I started uh, establishing links and observing our industry um, from a little bit more up, if you want, the sort of bird view of uh, why things were working the way they were, were working, how was the value chain organized, what was mm -hmm. the role of the architect, as seen not by a you know, business person or a construction person, but as an architect, but looking at it as a system, um, and, uh, well, I started to understand the importance of, uh, of, of business, of entrepreneurship for our industry and how one thing that I'm still very, very interested in, and I feel that it's very, uh, which is how we explain the value that we deliver to society and mm -hmm. we deliver to clients in the end, private and public. Um, so then I finished my master, kept all of that, of course, as a very, very valuable backpack and you know in my mind and came back had the opportunity to work uh leading the office uh of the former uh chair of architecture at harvard which is a great architect in spain uh iñaki avalos and who works as a partner together with renata sinkiewicz and they gave me they believed in me a lot gave me a lot of responsibility very soon and and and, and i had the opportunity to grow a lot and apply a lot of what i had learned there and even not things that I had learned and validated, but many ideas that I had about how things can be run, about how you can build big joint ventures, uh, about how you can defend a relatively medium-sized uh, company vis-a-vis -vis very big uh, other corporations and so on, and about how to explain value and about how to bring innovation inside the company beyond the innovation that is limited to the world of design, more like mm -hmm. bringing the ampler innovation that I had learned in part at IDU and so on. Um, and when I was working there, I've been, you know, I've always carried this since I was at school. Um, when I, I had the chance to be uh, educated in a Montessori school, my, my parents believed a lot in the, not only Montessori, but in the, the, the openness of different educational um, mm -hmm. systems. And I've had this passion for teaching and for learning um, and this high curiosity always. So um i always wanted to complement uh, my my professional activity um with teaching and I, I i did that when i was in in the polytechnic but i also had the opportunity to do it as you mentioned as a ta at harvard and in um some other universities punctually um and at one point i really believed that i was although i was pretty young because when i started as a, an academic director was uh, just had 30, 31 years old. Um, I believe that I had already sufficient to provide in order to craft a little um, academic proposal, uh, if you want. So mm -hmm. I took the step be before anybody asked me and I said, I want to be delivering some value to, to this sector, but how can I do it in a way that is different? Like I would enjoy a lot being a studio professor because I love design. Mm -hmm. or being a, you know an innovation professor but i'm always very uh, driven as well by this sense of in a way commitment and responsibility versus the, you know the, the opportunities you have so i felt i probably could be more useful working on this other uh, space that interests me so much and that i believe is pretty much uh unexplored which is the the interaction between or the the, the bridge between business innovation and, and mm -hmm. architecture and design so what I did was looking at all the universities that I had the possibility with my life setting of, you know, of applying to, which were mainly universities based in Spain, in Spain or universities that allowed to teach online. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that IE was a unique ecosystem uh, where it's, it was founded as a business school 
but the School of Architecture plays a very central role in connecting humanity, sciences, and, and business. Um, it has the international mindset. It, had a, it has an amazing uh, ecosystem of professionals. When I joined, the person that gave me the opportunity that I'm very, very thankful for was Martha Thorne, which at, at that time was the, the executive director of the Pritzker Prize of Architecture. And um, so what I did was say, okay, this is the place where I really want to work. And I guess I explained in a clear way quite synthetic, but clear way, two things. The first thing was, what do I believe that should be taught uh, in, this, in, in, in the domain of architecture that is not taught extensively out there in the world of universities? Um, and then why IE is the right place to, inst to put that, like a unique place to put that. So I did this application and this um, um, academic um, project, if you want, very brief academic project, and I proposed it to Martha and uh, with, uh, I guess, the luck that at that time they were just looking for someone to redesign that program, which had been on for a few years and to mm -hmm. give it a new new, new direction and uh, a little bit more of a modern approach. A lot of work, valuable work had already been done, um, but I had the opportunity to take leadership at that time. And now this is the fifth year that we have completed. So time goes by quickly. And extraordinary, really, really fascinating um, career journey there. And, you know, to be able to you know, be involved with schools like Harvard and the MIT Sloan School um, and kind of bring some of that expertise and also this, this different framework of looking at at the architecture industry, I find that really uh, deeply fascinating. So, so you, you mentioned there you were looking at things like the value chain and the value proposition of architecture and this kind of um, bottleneck, if you like, between the richness that is the architectural industry and education and thinking and the kind of you know how broader subject it is, and actually being able to communicate that to the real world and get you know um, compensated. Um, financially for it. This is a problem that we see in the architecture world right across the globe. Um, so, so what would be some of your kind of insights into the problems that, that um, we face as an industry um, with, with number one, with the education system, that's you know does does the education system um cause these sorts of problems is it responsible has it has it got a part to play and what what do you think are some of the solutions okay thank you so much um yeah great questions to be honest there's a lot there <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll start with the easy one <laughs> which is education um you know it's hard for me to say this because, as, again, I'm, I'm very passionate about design and about studio. Mm. Um, but I believe that when the systems that are present in the vast majority of universities right now um, were thought and designed, um, there was a there was a, a vision of the architect, and there was a society and a market that pretty much expected a like one one key path which was the path of the you know the, the the architect that does buildings that designs buildings right but changing curriculums in our in universities is it's not easy uh, there are a lot of regulations timing is also something because if in a company you get out an mvp and you test it in two weeks and you have feedback in a university you typically work on a yearly basis so things are not that fast to improve and then you have a lot of responsibility so a lot of supervision right so the thing that happened in my opinion is that when this was designed based on what i just said the the weight that was given to some of the areas, mainly the areas involved with inward, somewhat inward looking design, mm. were in a way over, over, oversized. Um, and that has produced amazing capacities of design, amazing creative uh, professionals, people with a lot of talent to address um, complicated or complex problems um, with the with the exercise of design in architecture but that could be applied to other industries but they've been in a way um they haven't been trained enough to move those ways of thinking into other areas and to apply those ways of thinking into real world problems so if we were speaking about business 
uh, we would be speaking, for instance, of a, an overserved market, right? When there's a solution that is too well designed for what the market really needs. And uh, I, I want to nuance this in a way. I'm not saying that design is not needed. I'm saying that um, the vast majority of architects do not need to go to the absolutely top level only on design because there are many, many other super relevant problems that are very rich and deliver a lot of value to society that are mm -hmm. overlooked. Um, so there are two things. The, the first is that as a result of that, key topics that are not necessarily um, related directly to our industry, but, at, but that are a core part of every citizen's and industry's life, such as a little bit of business awareness, such as um, um, communication to industries that are not the one you, you are used to deal with, um, and so on and so forth, were not put into the right proportion inside the curriculum. And it's if it is super hard to train an art, someone that is not in design to sort of learn the nuances and the you know unwritten rules of design, that's super hard. So we think that all the time of a university needs to be dedicated to that. But the truth is that once their brain has been wired in such a specific way, it becomes also pretty hard to understand how other domains work and how you need to fit within that from the business and, and value perspective for society. Um, so that's one. And the other one, which is very related, but it's not necessarily the same, has to do with free time and organization. It's a more mm -hmm. a cultural aspect. When I was at MIT, and I think that's something that also IE uh, uh, nurtures pretty well, uh, one of the things that I was amazed by is like when I, I imagined that I would go there and everybody would be extremely busy, you know, basically doing amazing things. And what I found is that, yes, they're busy. Um, of course, there's very admirable people there in the students and professors and so on. And they, they come up with brilliant things quite fast. But one of the things that I was amazed was that they valued a lot that free time for serendipity. Free time is a part of the curriculum. And free time doesn't mean, you know, going and, 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 and just, you know, drinking coffee or beer. It means having time to encounter people, to, 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 to explore ideas that might seem silly but end up being amazing, mm -hmm. uh, and to push forward those ideas in which you believe in a way that is completely informal, in a way, or unstructured, more than informal, unstructured, unguided. Um, and that generates a lot of thinking, and, and that, you know... Uh, not only you know production like objective production of ideas and businesses but also reflection reflection about who i want to be what is my professional direction is is the way that people understand architecture around me the way i understand architecture how can i drive my career to be a b mm. or c and that is extremely relevant in order to have a body of professionals or fresh graduates that think in a very diverse way which are in the end those that are going to go and compete in the market if we have that, we end up having people that dedicate time to develop the different angles of our profession. And you, you won't feel it in one year. But after 10 or 20 years, I can tell you, you, know, you, you see the difference. And if you mm. compare different markets where there's more or less presence of this diversity, you definitely see how the profession is better structured in these markets than in other markets where it's more uneven, right? So that's the education part. And maybe if you could, I've been speaking for a long time, so maybe if you could remind well, me a bit about this, the, the other part of the question. Well, I'm, I was, I was going talk, to start talking about some of the solutions, but actually, okay. let, let's stick here for a moment because there's there's so much in what you've just said that it's, it's really, really fascinating. And you, you started to point to here that the architectural education system in part is providing an over-designed solution for what's actually need in, needed in business. And again, you've been very careful to, 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 to say that it's not to devalue the education that you receive as, as an architect. And I'm very much on the same page with you here is that the architectural, mm -hmm. you know, thinking and design skills that we get are absolutely brilliant. And we are starting to see students who step outside of the architecture industry actually get way better compensated financially for those skills. We see it in UX design. We see it in all yeah. sorts of films of graphics and production and other sorts of businesses mm -hmm. where there's more kind of corporate entities where they can get involved in and they've got think tanks. Um, 
but it but it is very interesting this this over design solution and i you know again a conversation i have a lot with so many architects is um and particularly young architects as they come out of their education they've been training for seven to ten years they've invested a shed load of money then they sit in they sit inside an architecture practice and they're like i didn't need to I didn't need to go through all of that and spend all that money and I'm getting paid barely a livable wage here. Mm. Um, and that's, that's quite deeply problematic. And the, the culture of university also, I mean, I've, I've often thought that we're very good as designers to play with all of the constraints in architecture from engineering to political to communities in the context of university where there's play and experimentation and we turn those constraints into you know um into opportunities to design around but yet the commercial context is always negated in fact it's completely taken out and ignored and it's not and it's and, and i often hear people say oh we can put a marketing module inside of a inside of an architecture practice uh, inside of an architecture course and i'm like that's not yeah. gonna that's not gonna do anything it, it's a cultural thing, like you're saying. It's this. It's actually a culture because once you've been brought up in a culture for ten years, it's a long time yeah. to not to be ignoring the commercial context. Of course, when you come into industry, it's going to slap you in the face. And mm -hmm. in, in and for many for many architects, and this was my experience, was it was a kind of I didn't want that to be the reality of it. Um, and it causes, it does cause a lot of problems and it causes issues in terms of how we end up running our businesses, how we communicate, and it kind of causes this bottleneck in actually being able to communicate value. Because again, we haven't had this experience or the culture of we're operating in a commercial context. And part of operating in a commercial context is to go outside of our own industry and communicate value yep. to, to other disciplines. So really, really very, very fascinating kind of um, way you articulated that yeah it's uh, it's uh, actually I, I i resonate very much with what you just said on top of, of of my previous comments um i think there are a number of cultural things that are very important to understand and that are also in a way uh, preventing the profession as a whole or have prevented the profession as a whole because i think things are changing a bit um, from reaching its full potential. But let me articulate, I think there, there's a couple of ideas that are pretty interesting mm -hmm. in, and, and everything is like a little bit intricated, but um, one of the questions is, you know, why you were saying people, fresh graduates, study for a lot on really long time. Um, and I, as a spare comment, I think that, you know, part of that could be learned during practice uh, mm -hmm. pretty much as it happens in other domains. Um, uh, and then they end up in a company that pays low. And it's not that they pay low because they want to be pay, paying low their people. Everyone wants to be, you know, paying higher to, to people in a way, right? Um, uh, but it's because probably they have a, a business model that is not as efficient as they could. And mm -hmm. there are two things that we don't really understand in, in architecture at large. There might be many people that understand it. But a lot of people also don't understand is that what you are able to uh, uh, to to charge uh, or to extract as value um, is related with mainly three big variables. The first one, and I, I'm not putting them in necessarily in order, just mentioning mm -hmm. them. They're very related. The first one is competition and differentiation. If you're the only one in a market or the only one doing things differently in a market, you can charge more. Uh, we have very little notion about how to differentiate, how to explain yep. that differentiation, and about how to follow a path for differentiation. Because one thing is sitting the first day on your new office, your new company, and saying, oh, I want to be, I don't know, you know, a sustainable architect. And another very different thing is crafting a path to be the most sustainable architect and participative architect from, you know, now into 10 years uh, and, and really sticking to that and doing it. And you have to say a lot of times no, and you have to say the right yes uh, many times as well in order to craft that, strat that strategy and communicate in a very specific way. The second thing, um, so it, just as a, as a summary of that, I believe that right now, if you look at architecture companies, and I'm not mentioning the 10 top companies that everyone thinks of, I'm saying all the rest, the 99.99% of companies, mm -hmm. they're pretty much undifferentiated, many of them. I know 
some more mature and advanced markets like the UK, the US, and other markets are much more, adv uh, you know, are ahead on that. And you, you can see that there's a little bit more of that differentiation, but still compared to other places uh, or other industries, there's, there's a lot of room there for improvement. The second one is um, value versus reward. You cannot charge more if you're not able to articulate the level of value that you, or the amount of value that you're delivering. Um, and value can be, value is something that needs to be perceived by your client uh, or by the, by the society. And in order to be able to extract part of that value, which is something that every single company does, uh, there needs to be a balance between the amount of value you provide and the amount of value you extract, right? You might be delivering a lot of value, but if nobody is really looking at that value from, or, or understanding that value uh, in a way that resonates with them, they won't be able or willing to pay for that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do, and I'll, I'll add something to that after with a third variable, which is risk versus reward. So it's, you know, competition, value versus reward, and risk versus reward. The third risk is a pretty misunderstood topic. It's, if you look at real estate, for instance, why real estate you know, earn so much money uh, compared and the margins of real estate are so much higher than because they take a huge risk of uh, financing the whole or paying the whole party, regardless of whether, you know, we think or we like more or less some models of real estate development or not. I'm not entering there. I'm just focusing on, you know, why they, they, they assume a huge risk and then they take a big reward. And because they assume a huge risk, they're in a place of the chain, of the value chain, where they have a lot of say over a lot of decisions and processes that come after, right? For instance, the architect oftentimes on the traditional model comes to the party pretty late with everyone, you know, already kind of ate all the, all the cocktail, right? <laughs> and you're sort of distributing a, a little part of, that, of, that, uh, of those resources and trying to influence people, but from a position where you don't really own those resources, you're just a mere intellectual intermediary. You're not mm. really taking a risk apart from the reputation that your practice can have and apart from the fees that you're touching, which are, if you're lucky, you know, something between, uh, you know, 5% and 10% and of the value of the building, um, leaving aside the value of the, of the land, right? So it's, it's really a limited environment. If you understand those concepts, then you can start crafting and, and understanding all the skills that you were mentioning that the architect really has on like, you know, solving wicked problems, uh, being a very, very sharp strategy person, connecting different types of people, uh, making them believe in long-term processes, uh, a lot of things that um, uh, go, uh, carrying out with, with uh, complex situations where you don't know the answer, which is so embedded in our learning by doing culture. And all that, if you start leveraging all of that in order to take higher risk positions, higher yeah. value positions and better differentiated positions, then you start climbing up the value ladder. And maybe you're not going to become a real estate developer, but maybe you can partner with a real estate developer. And you can start thinking about, uh, instead of getting a fee at the end of the process, committing a little bit of risk on that fee, making it more variable, but in exchange, taking a, a better say from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and in the end, being able to have more control over the result and more... Um, uh, and more, uh, in the end, more impact, if you want, uh, and more freedom at the same time. So it's, well, it's, those are things that are um, important to reflect on, I believe. Yeah. I, mean, that, I mean, that's really interesting, you know, this idea of risk and reward and actually risk and being able to structure risk into the way that we're presenting our fees, you know, particularly, if you, again, like you say, we're talking to developers, that's their language, right? They're mm -hmm. into deal making, you know, they, they, they enjoy it when the architect participates in a bit of a risk. Otherwise, you you run the risk of just being perceived as a commodity. Yeah. And what's what's interesting is that the academic environment is the perfect place to have this discussion about risk because you don't have the risk of necessarily, you know, you're doing a project and making money. Because when yeah. you when you when you're learning this in the real world and running a business, you've got the lights to keep on, you've got other people's salaries to pay there's understandably more pressure, which makes the kind of experimentation with risk, um, you know, we, we approach it with a lot more, with a lot more caution. And perhaps this is not something I want to invest the time into 
into into right now. I mean, some architects do, and you know, a lot of the people that we work with at Business of Architecture, you know, we will have those conversations, and we've seen amazing people structure very interesting um, deals, and um, you know, the way that they've put their fees, they've deferred their their comments, compensation to to post a big milestone and they get some back end profits on the end of it, mm-hmm. or they um, get their fees paid from the profits that the developer makes. Fantastic. The, this is mm-hmm. a brilliant way of raising, raising your fees and to speculate about that in the context of, of a university environment. Well, you know, we would, we would see fees whoosh, shoot up. It's not, as you say, it's not just a, a question of being able to, to demand fees from clients they need to be able to understand what the value is it. And actually for a, de- for a developer client, there is an enormous amount of value with you sharing the risk with them. That's how, yeah. that's how all their other partners are working. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, well, first of all, I, I, I always say exactly that sentence to my students, that idea of that, the fact that university is a risk-free environment. Mm-hmm. It's the quintessential risk-free environment and from that perspective studying is one of the biggest luxuries one can have you're Mm. privileged because you have time which is the most amazing resource to use it in a way that everyone's kind of supporting you everyone wants to give you the most valuable information and and they want you to explore so it's a really great uh really great place to to be but when you go to the industry of course not 100 percent of the architects will be able to go into the most sophisticated business models but it doesn't have to be like that it just has to be better argumented from the beginning or better supported when you're designing the fees the problem is that we are in a very basic position to give you an example uh it's very extended in many markets um to charge a percentage of the cost of the building um which from the very basic logical point of view at least poses a, a conflict of interests um, because if, you, if it would be if it was really a, a, a direct relationship between you know the cost of the building and your fees then your interest is to be to turn the building as expensive as possible so that you know you you can charge more right um, and that's totally opposite to um, to the goals of your clients I mean mm-hmm. uh, first of all a client doesn't buy uh, doesn't buy real a building for the sake of having a building but for what it's able to do and host and, and promote and so on uh, and second even they ha- if they have all the money on earth they always want the most efficient use of resources so um, we're, we're at that point right when we have to articulate we have to progressively move away from those very, very basic ways of, of uh, explaining value. Um, yeah, th- th- those, are, th- those are things that are uh, really important. And, and from the more operational point of view, if you want, um, another thing that I see very, very often in companies is uh, structuring the way they charge their fees, the milestones mm-hmm. for charging their fees in a very, how to say it, um, awkward way in the sense that that it's it depends on third party uh, actions it depends on external forces that you not control such as you know a regulation or a or a permit that uh, you know depends on a person on an institution that doesn't even know your name mm-hmm. um, it's it's structured in timings that are completely unbearable for a, an SME uh, that is dedicated to design instead of coupling much better the fee uh, breakdown or the, 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 let's say the receivables breakdown with the deliverables uh, on a monthly basis or on a much more breaking down deliverables plan that allows you to get your money in hand in order to work much closer and not be financing your huge clients when you are an SME, yes. right? So super yeah. basic things, right? So it's not like we're speaking about rockets in the sky. We're speaking about very, very basic things that need to be really understood by everyone. It's, it's it's so fascinating, you know, th- those kinds of mechanisms, for example, you know, one of the biggest problems I'll see in architecture businesses is, is cash flow is the wild mm-hmm. cash flow feast or famine cycles architecture, the sales cycle is very long, can take a long time to close, pro- close a project, you might be 
courting a certain prospect for three months or six months eventually you close the deal then you don't take any upfront payment and then you're working mm -hmm. on a project for three months and it's and then the, the billing is based on a milestone the milestone is impacted by lots of other consultants other things outside of your control the milestone slips you know before you know it you, you could have like a nine month period of working on this project yeah, without absolutely. receiving any money for it and, you know, and that's a, that's a real, you know, it's a real, real problem. And this is one of the, the issues that kind of has a, a very significant impact on people's lives and well-being and their experience of, of working in a, in a, in a practice. So this, this kind of learning to structure or be creative and be putting money first and the, in the commercial context as a priority is is really really important I, I i like what you were saying as well about you know the, the architect often will be invited into a project a little bit later mm -hmm. and this is an interesting one because the the architect has these incredible set of skills of being a visionary of being able to move and operate in a very complex situation with lots of unknowns and start to sculpt something something logical something that's joining up lots of different ideas and pathways that perhaps the client would never have even considered of and that kind of upfront planning as well can make an enormous amount of money and yep. improvements to a project, you know, way later on down the line. But yet the architect is often getting invited in as a, you know, in worst case scenario, they're considered a, a kind of aesthetic consultant mm -hmm. to try and make the mess look pretty. And this is deeply frustrating for the architect. And it also means that when, when there's that kind of frame around the, the architect as a consultant, well, of course, you're not going to get paid very well. It's going to be very difficult and a developer will often have, here's our architectural fee that we've got, fit into that, Mr. Architect, and bugger off and shut up. Don't say anything anymore. And, and yeah. so, our, you know, finding a pathway to get that seat at the table much earlier on is, I think, I think a very interesting conversation. How, how do you suggest or kind of encourage or, or have, have seen architects do this, this arcing upstream if you like, to develop relationships much, much earlier on and be providing value at an earlier yeah. stage? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, first of all, uh, again, super interesting. I, I could be speaking for an hour about this. I know. It's hard to <laughs> sort of get into the, the point. But um, to, to, to answer your last question, you know, how, how does this translate into cases, right? Well, I think the first reflection is that when we speak about this, people often, often go into like, okay, so it's it's architects against these other people. It's architects against this model. It's either or. It's not either or. It's about blending the roles. And for instance, one thing is about having more design-focused architects inside the staff of prominent developers and not only finance people. Mm. You know, an architect can learn the finance of a, of, a, of a project pretty quickly. I mean, we're highly technical people in the vast majority of countries. So we do have that capacity to, you know, learn the dynamics. And, and, but we can also ask the whys and put the, the right or the hard questions at the beginning of those processes. So it's not like uh, make, about making developers disappear and, and, and taking over as architects. It's maybe about learning better how to collaborate and how to integrate developers uh, and other agents, uh, clients as well, uh, corporate clients, public organizations, um, as more uh, hybrid, uh, with a hybrid approach, right? I remember, for instance, you and I, the developer in, in, in the UK, we've yeah. done a number of things with them. And and uh, one of the workshops we do is where the students uh, have to present to their board uh, a, a sort of presentation of an architecture office and why, why would they partner to do a project from the beginning. Uh, and it's about alignment in value, about alignment in like, how do you see the model of the city? How can I make your real estate development uh, provide a value that goes beyond the square footage and, and a lot of these things, right? Um, so that that being said, um, I, I'll give you two examples that I feel that are just come to mind uh, that are specific examples. There are many more certainly, but, one of them is um, a, a company in the Netherlands that I admire deeply. Uh, it's a young, relatively young, middle-sized architecture office um, called Space and Matter. And uh, 
they are basically they they from all you know if you look at them from the outside it's just an architecture office but they have a very entrepreneurial vision uh, of identify when they identify a problem they try to take initiative and lead and orchestrate the people around that problem and they try to deliver a solution before someone asks for it in a way before there's a client right uh, and even if there's a client they try to, to be partnering from the very very beginning so from the perspective of um, you know specific projects there they have these the Koivo super famous project that um, it was a land in 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 the Amsterdam uh, on the other side of the river of, of Amsterdam in the north, and uh, it was like completely um, polluted, and and there was very little money to actually do this, and they to do something with that land for some time, and they were able to structure an ecosystem of resources and people where they would take boats that were pretty much sunken that would, were going to be very cheap in a way, and create an ecosystem where companies, innovation, uh, research labs, and these these um, themselves and, and and people in the surroundings would participate in creating there a, a small like innovation hub that would stand only for 10 years. Now they're preparing the second phase. Uh, hopefully it, it goes forward. But they structured it from the very beginning, even the financial model. It, it was not a sketch. It was not a 3D model on Rhino or on Revit. It was above anything. It was a financial model that mm. was supported by a very clear, precise spatial vision that was based on a very clear and precise value notion of like how you could bring value to these neighbors. That's one. Another example from London is uh, an office called Architecture Zero Zero. And as well, I like to put examples that are not, you know, the the super big companies uh, that you know everyone admires somehow, uh, but. <clears throat> They they were starting with um, Impact Hub, the the network of of uh, innovation hubs uh, and accelerator, um, uh, you know, uh, hubs in that are in London, in Madrid, and in many other cities in the world for startups and so on. And and they designed, if I'm not mistaken, the story is that they started designing one of these Impact Hubs um, in in one of the districts of London. Uh, helping them to, um, first of all, do the design, but then re found themselves pretty quickly that there were a lot of other problems around that space and around that idea. First of all, making sure that uh, there were um, there was a clear idea of how an impact hub like this would impact the economy of a neighborhood and delivering that value to the authorities that were needed to support that creation of that space. Uh, second, to of course, design the space, but design it in a way that is understanding how the business model operates, how companies mm. operate inside this space, how the fact that it's designed one way or another will help the owner and the operator of this building to extract more value and to deliver better opportunities for these startups to grow. Uh, and also, ultimately, which is very interesting, operating the building. Operating the building means making the business model of like, Cost, how you can exploit this building, which is a very important asset, how you can dynamize that, how you can communicate all of that. And you would say, okay, so let's, on the, from the traditional perspective, let's build this. We take someone to finance that, probably Impact Hub itself, uh, with some perhaps some external investors just making the case. And then you hire a designer, and then you hire an operator, and then you hire a, hire a maintenance company, and then you hire a marketing company for the communication. And they were, in a way, covering an important part of all of those. Uh, of course, they were not the ones, you know, changing the lights, uh, you know, or, or repairing the, 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 the plumbing or anything, but, but they were orchestrating the whole thing. And now, uh, if things have not changed since last time I spoke to them, they're still operating many of these uh, mm -hmm. spaces in a very interesting way. So, um, you know, and Amazing. I think, yeah, and, and to wrap with that, I think there's also an idea that is very... Uh, deep in our culture that I think is so um, is so pernicious for for our industry, which is this idea of or this tendency to criticize our equals. Um, when you speak in, in architecture schools about, you know, one architect or the other architect, and I won't say names, but like famous offices, it's very easy to point at one building or another building and say, you know, this is Sorry for the word. This is crap, right? Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's crap probably because it's not the quintessential design. But if you compare that to the rest of the world, it's probably within the 1% or 0.1% of the best buildings in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think we would learn a lot from looking at the value, trying to do a constant effort at looking at the value of what our other professionals are doing instead of only looking at the defects it has. Probably part mm-hmm. of that comes because we have a very undifferentiated landscape of companies. So if you feel that you are so equal, the only way to compete is criticizing the other one. Whereas mm-hmm. if you have your own value proposition and your own path, it's much easier to learn about you know how big communicates their projects, how they partner with their clients, how you know uh, this other company uh, is bringing engineering into the into their uh, operations, how Zaha Hadid is bringing coding into their team uh, in order to deliver uh, you know predictive modeling or doing you know interesting things with design and optimizing their the value for their clients or how MVRDB is bringing data about carbon uh, instead of saying you know oh this building looks ugly or this building is uh, is awkward from which perspective the perspective of you know your perspective of beauty or your perspective of functionality, it's something that is so open at this moment that mm. we, we should really do an effort on uh, to do that. And when I find companies that are trying to break those boundaries and going to different types of, of business models, um, they're often criticized for like you know not thinking as an architect or not putting design on top of everything. But a sentence or a, a value that we have in, in my company, but also at the MBR is... You, you have to understand that it's not business or design. It's that business is a, is a scenario where, biz- where design can thrive. It's like when you go to visit a spectacle and you see the dancer or the theater, everything is around prepared so that the singer thrives, right? The lighting, mm-hmm. the scene, the, there's silence, everyone's looking at the same direction. All of that is prepared so that when the design, wh- when the singer comes, everything works perfectly and enhances that. And I believe design is a little bit the singer and business is a little bit of the rest, right? So mm-hmm. super important to understand that. I love this. It's absolutely fascinating. There, um, I'm reminded of a quote that Bjarke Engels uh, once said where he was talking about how you know architects we criticize each other and he'll often get criticized and people will say, oh yeah, but he's just a marketer. Or he's just a salesperson, and yep. it's meant when, when you hear someone kind of throw that out as a as an architect about another architect, it's kind of implying, well, your work has got no substance. Your work lacks mm-hmm. any kind of design pedigree. It's not very good, and and it's very interesting, you know, that actually the culture of just educating ourselves solely with a with a with inside of design, where we're so heavily saturated with with the, this design lens mm-hmm. that actually it kind of impedes our ability to be able to intelligently discuss and criticize work because we just look through it through this design lens and we, we forget the whole story and narrative of, mm-hmm. of the problems that it was solving for the client and the context and the budget and all of this stuff that makes architecture very interesting that gets kind of put to the side. And when, and then the other thing is when other people outside of the industry see us as architects criticizing each other like that what do you think they think <laughs> well it, it, it's ugly i mean it, it, it's always ugly to to criticize someone when you don't really have a a, a, a very strong argument right but but i think mm. you're what what is most important in what you're saying is that oftentimes we're not looking at so it's so embedded in our way of thinking that like it's as if the whole market in the world, as if the whole environment, built environment in the world was only looking for that 1% type of design, the Peter Sumtor quintessential, mm-hmm. you know, masterpiece. And, you know, that name or whatever other name, I admire them. I love their design. And again, I'm passionate about design. But I understand that the world is not that. There are so many other extremely impactful things that need to be done. And that if we are working in different angles of the profession and the built environment, we will make better a better impact as a whole. It's not me against, you know, me, the business guy or the, you know, the, the, the pro bono guy or the whatever infrastructure guy against Peter Zumtor. It's not like that. It's an industry that works all together. So if we mm-hmm. argument better the value of design, the, the, those on the 1% will be able to work better, but also those that are fighting to get water uh, infrastructure to third world countries. Um, and 
you know, there are key problems that are just left for engineers or for other people. It's like, what about, you know, infrastructure access, housing price? Uh, what about the industrial world where 90% of the projects are done without, you know, giving a thought to like how this is organized, like from, from industrial complexes to the industrial warehouse themselves? What's going on there? Like, who thinks about this? Only engineers? Uh, you know, we have a lot to say on these spaces that that occupy such a vast territory inside and outside the, the, the cities, right? So it's, it's, it's I, I believe that there's one value that brilliant people, people that I admire tend to have, which is that when you have your own profession, you, you might have your own profession, you might have your own interests, but you also live in a certain and particular time. And mm -hmm. that particular time has certain fights that are more relevant than others. And when you fight people that change things, they're always in a blend between what they really liked and what they believe was impactful, not only what they had fun doing. And I believe that too many people are trained to do what they're how they have fun doing instead of trying to balance what they really are passionate about, but also believe is impactful. We mm -hmm. cannot all be on that 1%. We should yeah. diversify and value the rest of the people. Work. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I kind of want to carry on talking for like another couple of hours with you, but we're kind of coming close to the uh, to, to the top of the hour mark here. Um, this has been really, really fascinating. Um, could you just give us a little bit of insight on then on on those, the the other sorts of topics that you cover in in the MBA? Yeah, well, we cover um, basically we try to cover um, give an overview uh, of the different areas of business with a very particular focus on architecture, engineering, and construction, uh, the built environment at large. Uh, so we cover from strategic management to operations management to financial management, but also marketing. Uh, and then we have a number of, uh, we cover a lot of courses. There are 20 big topics, but um, we also have some specific courses that are interesting that are, uh, for instance, courses that you wouldn't find on a, on a program that is not directly an MBA arc or that you want, wouldn't find in any other MBA in the world, which is value creation through design. How do you structure value? How do you understand value? How can you craft that idea better? Um, design communication and strategy. So it's not marketing. Yeah, we, we have a course on marketing, about marketing theory and about marketing channels, tools, and so on. But also we have a course about about the strategy of design and its relationship to marketing and communication in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a very, very ample module that sort of connects everything, which is the module of, um, of entrepreneurship and innovation, which is what I am, that's the, the, the model that I'm leading and co-leading together with a business professor. Uh, and that is, is, a, is a lab that goes for the whole year and where students end up doing a, a, an entrepreneurship project that can be an office, of mm -hmm. architecture or can be a technology startup, but the only requirement is that it has to be in far impactful for the built environment. And that also sort of connects with my company, Buildia, and, you know, uh, my journey as well as an entrepreneur uh, on, on the side of, on my case, particularly on the side of uh, supply chain digitalization and, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and carbon reduction in construction. Yeah. Well, that, well that, that's, a, that's a good little segue just to, to hear a little bit about um, Buildia and, and what, what that is. I understand it's not, it's not your traditional architecture practice. It's much more like a piece of software, correct, which is doing um, yeah. cost estimations and actually helping the supply chain side of things. Yeah. So our vision is to be the supply chain software ecosystem for construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the built environment. What we do is we centralize, automate, uh, and help companies to bring real-time data gathering and visualization on everything that's related to supply chain from procurement operations, pre-construction and construction, to supply operations, manufacturers and their relationships with the resellers, digitalizing that, helping them to automate e-commerce B2B, uh, in a very specific way for for our industry it's very important to understand that you cannot just come and digitalize things as if you were digitalizing uh i don't know the clothes industry we have very specific relationships between architect real estate developer builder subcontractor reseller of products and serve and, and and systems and then manufacturer so we have a an ecosystem a platform and softwares that help to bring all of them um 
with a specific value proposition for each, all of them digital and all of them interrelated. So at the moment, we're working with, uh, with general contractors uh, in helping them to automate and, as I was saying, centralize their supply chain uh, operations, mainly pre-construction and construction procurement, and also with manufacturers to help them to integrate their distribution network. So their relationships with resellers and B2B clients, bring them digital and pair them as well with uh, offline uh, processes. So working on my channel, all of that connected in a single ecosystem. And in terms of long term, of course, the value chain, the, the supply chain in construction is uh it's super important for carbon embodied carbon understanding and for uh many other things so we're, we're also working on different projects on uh data uh, data collection and and predictive modeling of pricing and supply chains carbon tracing and accounting and all of those things that are more part of our long-term vision and what we we are very deeply motivated in by uh, from the perspective of impact or what we would say you know the real impact in a way amazing i think that's probably the topic for our next podcast <laughs> we, we, we'd, we'd just talk about that um absolutely fascinating conversation today so i really appreciate your your time and sharing your expertise here i, I, I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you um and we're definitely going to have to have you back on the on the show again to continue the conversation but i think now is a perfect place for us to conclude so geronimo thank you so much Thank you so much, Ryan, and uh, congratulations for the amazing podcast that you have, uh, that I'm uh, a follower. So much valuable content out there. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure, really enjoying. And uh, yeah, I can go and speak about Buildia whenever you want. Happy. Amazing. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you. Thanks, Ryan. Bye. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.